Hi, Dr. Kat Fleece here from Central New Mexico Community College. In video C of the brain, we're going to focus on the functions of the cerebral cortex. When we started our discussion on the brain, we learned that the brain is bilaterally symmetrical anatomically speaking. But that is not 100% true for when we take a look at functions. So even though most functions tend to tap into many, many parts of the brain, both the left and the right side, we do see a little bit of specialization in each one of the cerebral hemispheres, particularly in the left versus the right cerebral cortex, but not a whole lot. So for instance, we do see that the so-called language areas tend to be concentrated in the left cerebral cortex in most people. And so because of that, because there is a little bit of specialization of the cerebral hemispheres, we say that there is some lateralization in the brain and that we can talk about cerebral dominance. The cerebral dominance referring to that particular cerebral hemisphere that has the language areas. It does happen in some people that their language areas are in the right hemisphere. And so they would express cerebral dominance, therefore, in the right uh, hemisphere. But once again, really pretty much all functions, even languages, are going to still require some input, some help from the other hemisphere. So to, to really say that each hemisphere has very unique functions is not quite accurate. We will still continue to use the term lateralization and cerebral dominance, but it's really important for you to realize that no function in the brain is going to be very isolated to one side of the brain. Um, it, it usually requires most of both sides of the brain. And this can happen easily in most cases because the left and the right cerebral hemispheres are interconnected by a big chunk of white matter, which we refer to as the corpus callosum. I will point that out on pictures when we get to our discussion of the white matter in one of the future videos. In your OpenStax book, I would like for you to read uh, the topic titled Myth of Left versus Right Brain. So lateralization is not a, an absolute true aspect of the brain, but we do see a little bit of specialization. So let's just take it from there. And because of that, we can talk about three major functional areas. We refer to them as the primary sensory areas, the primary motor area, and then there are so-called association areas. An anatomist in the 1900s by the name of Brodmann, he discovered 52 functional areas with a rather interesting technique he used to identify various areas of the brain that seem to have uh, relatively specific functions. So you might hear at times books talk about the 52 areas of Brodmann or Brodmann's areas. We're going to study some of them, um, particularly those that we can easily identify as primary sensory and primary motor area, and we'll point out some of the association areas. Sensory areas, that is primary sensory areas, of course, are going to be um, areas that allow us to interpret, consciously interpret, information that is arriving in the brain. So stimuli that have been converted into electrical signals. On the other hand, um, a motor area, a primary motor area, is going to be responsible for sending out action potentials that eventually reach our skeletal muscles so that we can voluntarily contract them. So there's control of our voluntary movements in the primary motor area. Association areas are pretty much all areas that do not start with the term primary. 
and their function is to make sense of the information, the sensory information that arrives in the brain, mull it over, to put it in layman's terms, come up with decisions, and then have the primary motor area, for instance, carry out the, the voluntary movement if that is what needs to happen. Now some of the pictures that are upcoming are not always going to clearly identify the areas as primary. So I'll help you out initially and then you will catch on uh, which ones really should have that uh, term primary uh, as part of their name. So here we see a picture I will be using over and over again. So make sure that you really study it in this big uh, picture because in future slides I will reduce its size just to help you understand the text in my slides. So first of all recognize I've list left you a little note that says notice that I've added primary to the primary sensory areas. So for instance right here just here's your central sulcus right let me indicate that with black so here's your central sulcus one of your landmarks and here's your lateral sulcus and that tells you based on the curving of these two sulci that this is the anterior side of the brain and this is the posterior side of the brain okay so this brightly or this deeper blue i should say is the primary sensory cortex. I will probably give this an even more specific name in one of the next slides. It sits in a gyrus posterior to the central sulcus, so we call it this region the post-central gyrus. On the other hand, anterior to the central sulcus, we have our primary motor cortex, so it sits in the pre-central gyrus, so this bump we call the pre-central gyrus. We have a primary visual cortex. Notice that here I have added that term primary because it was lacking, but that is a primary sensory area. And here again, I have added the term primary for the primary auditory cortex. So the bright green here on the very back of our cerebrum in that occipital lobe, that is our primary visual cortex and in the temporal lobe, where it meets with the parietal lobe, we have the primary auditory cortex. Now the other thing that you can notice is that surrounding a primary sensory area, you have an association area for that sensory area. For instance, in the lighter yellow, we see the auditory association area. In the lighter green, we see the association area for the visual sensory area. And in the lighter blue, quite large part of the cerebral cortex, we see the association area for our, for our primary sensory cortex. All right. Now, in addition to that, we see some complex association areas that we will be discussing as well. We're first going to focus on the many primary sensory areas in the cortex of the cerebrum. And you'll see pretty quickly that most of the sensory input is going to arrive in sensory areas, primary sensory areas that are located in either the occipital area, the temporal, uh, I'm sorry, occipital lobe, temporal lobe, or the parietal lobe on either side of the brain. This is a slide that I will use repetitively, and I believe we've looked at it once before. It's important because it shows the flow of neural signals, and there's a lot of information here, and by no means are you ready to know and understand every uh, ana anatomical structure listed here. So for now, follow what I am um, pointing to and what I am giving you the terminology for. So let's say that you place your hand, your fingers, underneath running water. And of course you have sensory receptors in your fingers. And remember, sensory receptors in your fingers are literally dendrites of sensory neurons. And when these dendrites detect a stimulus, ion channels open and greater potential summate and eventually we fire an action potential or action potentials. So these action potentials are going to um, travel up the axon, 
of our sensory neuron up the axon into the central nervous system, which is right here, the spinal cord. So we haven't looked at the spinal cord's anatomy, but in this picture you see that it's made up of some gray matter in the, letter, in the form of a letter H, and then the remaining tissue, nervous tissue, is white matter. So this is all there is to the spinal cord, this right here. So notice, as should be the case, as, as you have learned, that our sensory neuron leaves its cell body outside of the central nervous system. And if many sensory neurons do that, we literally form a sensory ganglion here, right? So a sensory ganglion forms here if we have a collection of cell bodies here. That's why it's kind of swollen looking here. The remainder of the axon continues to climb up the spinal cord until we finally get to the brain and there it'll synapse with our first interneuron. That interneuron then synapses with another in interneuron inside of the brain. And where this arrives, the second interneuron is going to be one of our sensory areas, primary sensory areas. In this case, it would be our primary, um, primary somatosensory area, which we'll discuss in, in the next few slides. So the association areas are going to interpret this information and make decisions and come up with action potentials to now make muscles move in our hands and our fingers to where we might be wiggling our fingers or maybe moving our hand away from the either too cold a water or too hot a water. And so here then, starting in the cortex, and this would have to be our primary motor cortex, we see an interneuron in the red leaving the brain and descending into the spinal cord. And at a certain level in the spinal cord, this interneuron in the red will now synapse with the cell body and dendrites of our somatic motor neuron, which carries action potentials towards our muscles. So of course, you guys know this by now, this red, I'm sorry, uh, yes, this red neuron here, right now they call it a lower motor neuron. This is a somatic motor neuron. Don't worry yet about the term lower motor neuron. You're not quite ready for that. So this is our somatic motor neuron. Remember that somatic motor neurons always innervate skeletal muscle cells and they release acetylcholine that cause depolarization. So this gives you some idea of how information enters the spinal cord and then travels up into the brain to a particular area of the brain and how <clears throat> eventually commands in the form of action potentials leave a particular area of the brain, descend, <clears throat> the, those action potentials descend into the spinal cord and then leave the spinal cord to then go innervate parts of the body. Let's get started with the primary somatosensory area in the cortex, which is located right here in that post-central gyrus that sits just posterior to the central sulcus. And notice that I prefer to call it the primary somatosensory area because it reminds me when we use the term soma somato that the stimuli are coming in from the body and when we use the term somato, which means body, we mean no viscera, but everything else. And so that therefore leaves us with the skin, the skeletal muscles, the joints, even the connective tissues around the bones. And we also can see that when this information from the skin, from the skeletal muscles, the joints, the bones, arrives in this particular area of the cortex, in that uh, post-central gyrus, it is very organized in how it arrives. It's as if all of the sensory neurons that start in the hand tend to keep their axons pretty close together as they enter into the brain. 
And that allows us to therefore draw a little human being on that primary somatosensory cortex. We call that a sensory homunculus, homunculus little human being. And the fact that everything is so beautifully organized in the brain, uh, such as in this sensory homunculus, um, that is referred to as somatotopy, literally meaning the topographical arrangement of the body. Now, this actually applies to most of the brain, particularly the cortex. It even applies to the spinal cord. So the way neural signals travel either from the body into the brain or even from the brain down the spinal cord and out to the body, it is very beautifully organized anatomically and we refer to that as somatotopy. It also helps us with spatial discrimination. And what that means is that, let's say that you put a compass which has two sharp points on somebody's back and you put the two points you know, relative, let's say about uh, an inch or so apart. More than likely that person cannot distinguish between those two points. But if you put that same distance on a person's lips, they will be very easily, they'll, they'll be able to very easily distinguish the two sharp points. And so that's what we mean by spatial discrimination. And we can see that this is indeed the case based on how much area our brain dedicates to our very sensitive parts of the body. Take a look at the fingers and the hand. Take a look at our lips. Take a look at our tongue, at how much space is devoted to that, these areas in the um, primary somatosensory area. The fact that we can draw such a big hand tells us that lots and lots of neurons arrive here just for the hand and the fingers alone. Now compare that to our trunk and our thigh. I mean, those are huge structures compared to our hand and our fingers, and yet they get such a small amount of space, meaning that those parts of the body are not giving rise to lots of sensory neurons, and therefore they are not quite so sensitive. And therefore, the spatial dis discrimination here is much less than the spatial discrimination on your hands or on your lips, for instance. And of course, by being able to draw a nice map of a human being on the brain like this, on the cerebral cortex like this, it, it's, uh, it's important clinically because we can very easily connect a part of the body with what part of the brain has been damaged. In addition to the primary somatosensory cortex, remember it is located here in the darker blue, we have primary areas, primary sensory areas, for each one of the special senses. Now, let's make sure we know what the five special senses are in the body. And they are all going to be located, or I should say they're all carried out, the special senses, by our four special sensory organs. So we have four special sensory organs, and you know what those are. Let's just quickly list them. Special sensory organs, and they include, of course, your eyes, your nose, your ears, and then the mouth with the tongue right, where we have our taste buds. And we have five special senses, so our eyes are responsible for sight, our nose is responsible for smell, what is a fancy word for smell? Olfaction, right? Our ears allow us to hear, and our ears are responsible responsible for detecting equilibrium or balance changes. So there are two special senses. So one special sense for the eyes, one special sense for the nose, but two special senses for the ears, and then the mouth or with the tongue is involved in taste. 
So we have a total of five special senses. Now, why do, do we call them special senses? Well, because they require special sensory receptors, and we will learn how they are separate and different from simple sensory receptors. So what is an example of a simple sense? It would be touch and pain and changes in detecting temperature, for instance, right? None of those are part are, are functions of your uh, special sensory organs. Okay, so now that we know the five special senses, it's going to be easy to list the additional primary sensory areas. And so we have the primary visual, the primary auditory, the primary vestibular. Vestibular always refers to equilibrium. There's a region inside of your inner ear called the vestibulum where we have equilibrium receptors. The primary olfactory sense of smell and the primary gustatory gustare referring to taste. Be sure that you know where each one of these primary um, areas are located. Notice that it should here say, I corrected that in a previous picture, but this should say primary visual cortex, primary auditory cortex, um, and not all of them are um, labeled on our picture. For instance, olfactory and gustatory are going to be either on the inside here of our temporal lobe. So if we peel this away and we look on the inside, we see the medial aspect of the temporal lobe where primary olfactory um, sensation is located and then or sensory area I should say is located and the primary gustatory is located uh, in the insula. So now we're ready to take a look at the primary motor cortex. So there's only one primary motor cortex. We had a total of uh, six primary sensory areas. So the primary motor cortex sits on the other side of the central sulcus. Remember the central sulcus is right here. This is a nice picture because it allows you to visualize things more three-dimensionally. Here's your longitudinal fissure separating to the two halves of the cerebrum. We already studied the purple region. Remember that is the post-central gyrus where the primary somatosensory area is located. We've already pointed out the primary auditory cortex, the primary visual cortex, right? So this time we're going to focus on the region anterior to the central sulcus, better called the precentral gyrus, and that is where our primary motor cortex area is located. This is the area where we have voluntary control over our skeletal muscles. And of course, because this is our precentral gyrus, we're now located in the frontal lobe. You may want to click on this particular link here. I'm not going to do this for you right now, but, um, but you may want to use this link here to allow for this picture to rotate. And then you, this is especially for many of you who are like me, three-dimensionally challenged. It's very difficult for me to see things three-dimensionally, which is why I give you so many different kinds of pictures. But this is a nice, um, a little quick uh, video that allows you to rotate the image so that you can see that the shape of your primary motor cortex and the shape of your primary somatosensory area is like this when you're looking at the brain um, anteriorly. So let's revisit this picture one more time. Sensory information from the fingers is going to enter via sensory neurons into the spinal cord, up into the brain. There we have a synapsis with an interneuron, another synapsis with an interneuron, and the action potentials arrive in the primary somatosensory area of the cortex. And then eventually, action potentials will re leave via a, an interneuron that leaves the primary motor cortex, descends into the spinal cord, where it synapses with the cell body of our somatic motor neuron 
that then makes our skeletal muscles contract. Now, in order for these action potentials to fire from the um, primary motor cortex, we're going to also need help from areas that are involved in the planning of the movement. So we're going to see that association areas need to help out your sensory areas and your motor area, your primary areas, that is, so that the motor area can actually carry out its particular function of making skeletal muscles contract. Now, I don't have a picture of this, but remember the sensory homunculus? We can do the same thing for the motor area, the primary motor area, and draw a motor homunculus. In other words, we're going to see that lots of space in the cortex of the primary motor cortex is allocated to muscles that require very fine movements, um, meticulous movements, such as we see occurring with our fingers, our tongue, our face, um, etc. And again, as you know, this is clinically important because then we can be, we are able to connect uh, an injury to a particular finger to a specific spot in the brain. Okay, so we're now going to discuss the much more complex association areas. Remember, there are three functional areas in the cerebral cortex. The sensory areas, the primary sensory areas, that is, of which there are six. You have one primary motor cortex, and then you have many association areas. Some of these association areas are more associated with the primary sensory areas, and some of them are more associated with the primary motor cortex. And then a third group of association areas are so complex that we put them into their own separate group of very complex or better multimodal association areas. Remember that association areas do not start with the, the word primary. And what they do is they collect all of the sensory information and literally make sense out of it, make decisions, allow us to think, allow us to communicate by means of thinking of words and being able to form the words with our mouth and tongue um, and allowing for words to be put in the correct order such that we create a speech that's understandable. Association areas can be so complex that they allow us to think abstractly, uh, to plan, to judge, to think about the future, um, etc., etc. In humans, association areas are extremely well developed and they make up a much higher percentage of our brain um, than other animals out there in the animal kingdom. If we first focus on the association areas that help out interpret, to interpret the information from our primary sensory areas, then remember they are typically located, as should make, and that should make sense, nearby their primary sensory area. So here's your sensory, I'm sorry, your somatic sensory association area, which is going to in interpret the information that arrives in the primary somatosensory area. And here's your visual association area, which is going to interpret the information that arrives from the eyes in the visual or the primary visual area. So remember, again, this should say primary here. And in front of auditory cortex, it should also say primary. And there are, of course, more primary sensory areas, but we can't label all of them because some of them are deeper within the brain. So let's take a look at an example of what the somatosensory association area does for us. And I always like to give this example. For instance, you know, I have moments where I, I'm literally addicted to gummy bears, let's say. And um, I will sometimes have them sitting in my pockets as I'm lecturing because I forgot to eat them all. And so as I'm lecturing, I might put my hands in my pocket and feel, 
right? And so I'm literally lecturing and trying to explain all kinds of complex things to my students, but I can feel the texture, I can feel the shape, is it sticky or not? I can feel how big this little thing is inside of my pockets. And based on what I have learned in the past, I can now interpret this as, oh yes, these are my gummy bears that I should have eaten because they're going to get all sticky and messy in my pockets, right? So that's an example of what a somatosensory association area does for us. So it forms a comprehensive understanding of the stimulus uh, by making sense of the size and the texture of what we are detecting especially. And so and we can think of it uh, the same way when it comes to visual stimuli. You know, with the help of our primary visual cortex, we can see, but that doesn't mean that we can understand what we see. For that, we need the visual association areas, and even more, but the visual association areas are allowing us to recognize, oh, that's that thing I'm looking at is such and such a color, it has this shape, and oh, it's not moving, so based on what I have experienced in the past, that must mean the following. So notice that these association areas are very dependent on past experiences. And again, similarly for the auditory association area. There are also a couple of association areas that really help out our primary motor cortex. So for instance, right here in the lighter pink, we have the premotor cortex, or your book might call it the somatic motor association area, which then literally tells you that it's going to be related to our primary motor cortex. In addition to that, more in the, um, at the junction of the frontal lobe with the lateral sulcus of the temporal lobe, we have Broca's area. And Broca's area is an important motor association area such that we are sending from this part of the brain the correct signals to our tongue such that we create a speech that's understandable to the person that we're trying to communicate with. So Broca's area is an example of a motor association area. So what about the premotor cortex? Well, our premotor cortex plays an important role in planning and coordinating the movements of muscles that are important to, to, our, um, to the maintenance of our posture and the maintenance even of, um, uh, of maintaining our core. In addition, the premotor cortex plays a very important role in, in movements we've learned by lots of drilling, for instance, by typing, or uh, another example of, a, of movements that we learn by drilling is playing instruments like piano or violin, or even uh, dance steps. You know, one of the things that happens to this part of the brain, the premotor cortex, is it becomes very active. You know, lots of blood starts to flow there when, let's say, you need to perform a dance routine and you're standing there um, on, on, you know, on stage behind the curtain still, your mind is very actively going through your movements, yet you're not using any skeletal muscles yet at this point in time. So even prior to actually executing these movements, this part of the brain is already planning those movements. Our most complex association areas we'll refer to as multimodal association areas, and they're going to depend on input from all kinds of uh, sensory areas. So information from sensory areas will arrive in the primary sensory cortex areas, and then they move to the association areas, and then from there, they're going to move to these multimodal association areas. And there are two types of multimodal association areas I need you to be aware of. Uh, 
Wernix area, some people say Wernicke's area, is the area located right here. So it is right at the junction of our temporal lobe and our parietal lobe. So it has a little chunk of the parietal lobe, a little chunk of the uh, uh, temporal lobe, and it sits just posterior to our primary auditory cortex. And this makes sense because Wernicke's area is the area that allows us to understand speech. And of course, to be able to understand speech, we're going to need to depend especially on the uh, auditory areas. Now, a very well-developed part of our brain is located in the most anterior portion of our frontal lobe. And this origin, orangish region is yet another example of a multimodal association area, a very complex, very evolved area in the brain of humans called the prefrontal cortex. Let's take a look at the next slide to better understand this multimodal association area. The prefrontal cortex is really what, where our personality develops. It's also where we have our conscience located so we can distinguish the good from the bad or uh, identify that uh, this, this is better than that or this is different and that is the same. Um, it's also that part of our brain that allows us to predict outcomes. In other words, it, it has the ability to collect information from the past, memories, and interpret them such that our current situation is such that that part of the brain can predict if we do A, then B will happen. If we do C, then D will happen based on those past experiences. Now it takes time for that prefrontal cortex to develop. As a matter of fact, this part of our brain in particular continues to develop well into our 20s. And this might explain why you as a young adult, or if you have teenage kids, um, you're not always making the wisest decisions you're still primarily depending on your emotional region of the brain to make decisions rather than your prefrontal cortex, which hasn't finished developing. You haven't collected and stored enough memories from the past. Your synaptic connections haven't quite established enough, well enough yet to where you can make sound decisions about um, what is the best thing to do next considering what I see right here in front of me. And that's why we see the kind of um, irresponsible behavior very often in teenagers. And in many ways, we need to be forgiving of them because they just don't have that part of their brain developed yet. The prefrontal cortex will also be very dependent on its social environment to develop properly. You know, Part of the reason for why a number of um, criminals cannot really distinguish the good from the bad or do not have much of a conscience is more than likely because of their social environment when they were children. If we expose our brain to a social environment that is not nurturing, that doesn't teach us the good from the bad, we're just never going to learn it. So keep that in mind as well. So all these things I have just discussed um, are very much related to functions that we tend to summarize as the executive functions of the prefrontal cortex. So we can execute um, a decision to where we will not do the bad and only do the good. Uh, we can predict outcomes, so that's another executive uh, function. We can even ensure that we're not going to jump up in joy in front of, um, let's say, our current president when we're, um, you know, maybe awarded or maybe recognized for something wonderful we did. We, we remain composed. In other words, we succeed in controlling 
uh, socially unacceptable ur urges. And we also use this part of our brain to ambitiously work towards a defined goal. So we refer to that as conscious motor monitoring. In other words, we can continuously, consciously, uh, voluntarily decide which uh, motor functions to use to reach a particular goal. And then finally, let's not forget that along with all of these exec executive functions, we're needing to stay attentive and focused. We need to depend on our intellect and cognition, memory. We need to be able to judge and reason and analyze, etc., etc. Very important part of our brain, probably the part of our brain that sets us apart from all other animals. It's also very closely linked to our limbic system, and we'll see what exactly the limbic system is towards the end of our discussion of the brain. There are two what we call functional brain systems. One is called the limbic system, and we nickname it as our emotional brain. So the limbic system, you'll often hear it being referred to as our emotional brain. So therefore, again, because it's linked to this emotional brain that is the prefrontal cortex, and if the prefrontal cortex is not quite finished developing yet, that explains perhaps why we tend to fall back on these emotional decisions when we're younger in particular. Finally, I'd like for you to read um, in your book or go online, I don't really care where, about this guy, Phineas Gage, who um, experienced a ridiculously crazy injury to his skull. Um, this was sometime in the 1900s, if I remember correctly, er early 1900s. There are pictures that you can see that um, confirm exactly how his brain, his skull, and therefore his brain was injured, and how that possibly affected his prefrontal cortex and um, possibly his personality and conscience and executive functions. So this finally wraps up our discussion of the cerebral cortex. So that was a lengthy discussion and we took uh, two videos to do it. So that tells you what important part of a brain this is. So in the next videos, we're going to continue with the other parts of the cerebrum and after that continue with the um, cerebellum, the diencephalon, and the brainstem.